Hello and welcome to BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Root of BTN, and we're back with another great episode, another uh, pretty jam-packed episode here on the show as we roll along through BTN's summer here in Chicago. Um, we've got a two-part show today with one interview and one recurring segment. The interview to start us off is a fun and timely one with Lisa Byington. Lisa has been a voice of BTN since the beginning. She's been a sideline reporter, play-by-play woman, uh, just about everything we've asked her to do. She's done here and um, done it well and done it in trailblazing fashion. Uh, she's the first woman to call a football game as a play-by-play voice here on BTN. So she's uh, broken barriers and she's just done a great job for us here. And now she is currently calling the Women's World Cup on Fox. So she was gracious enough to take some time out of that extremely busy schedule to give me about a half hour and talk about her career, her rise, and her current gig calling the Women's World Cup. So some awesome uh, behind the scenes insight into what goes into that, uh, you know, extreme and um, massive undertaking calling a Women's World Cup on a stage like that. And just an overall really fun interview with Lisa and it was fun getting to know more about her so stay tuned for that following Lisa's interview we have a call for the culture segment with Colleen Degnan if you've never uh, listened to the show or haven't heard it in the past few months we we do a recurring segment with our producer Colleen and she talks the intersection of sports pop culture entertainment social media it's basically just a laid-back discussion about what's going on uh, in the world of sports and entertainment today so fun discussion with colleen coming up after our interview with lisa and we'll get into that interview with lisa byington the voice of many sports on btn football basketball softball volleyball you name it and one of the current voices of the women's world cup the interview with lisa byington starts right now I'm very pleased to be joined by someone with a very full play right now. She works for BTN, and she's currently calling the FIFA Women's World Cup for Fox. It's Lisa Byington. You can follow her on Twitter at Lisa Byington. Lisa, how's it going? Oh, it's great, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Apologies if I, like, I'm, I think I just see soccer balls across everywhere I look, you know. Um, <laughs> it's It has been a really busy but um, very rewarding last, last really week and a half as we're uh, into the tournament now. Yeah, I'm honored that you... Uh, carved out a little time to come on the podcast during a very busy time and as I included in that introduction uh obviously a very prestigious role calling the women's world cup right now for Fox and anyone who watches that event knows it's, it's just a ton of soccer packed into a month and a huge production for um a, a tv company so how did you find the time to squeeze this interview first of all in between all your world cup responsibilities I know we had to, to move it around a little bit to, to work it out well, if I don't talk in complete sentences, it's because I'm actually studying as we do this podcast. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, it's it, it, there's a lot of uh, there's obviously a lot of prep work that has to go into it. Um, what you know, this is my first time doing it, so I had to ask a lot of questions to some of the other play by plays in particular about how they approached it. And and what I did is, you know, from group stage, we really are kind of responsible for about nine to ten teams in ten countries to know. So what I made sure that I did is um, even before the tournament began, I I really had to get my boards done in terms of just biographical information about each player, the coaches, kind of their journey, the qualification, how they got to the tournament, all that stuff. I wanted all that prep work done before the tournament began. And they really gave us, Fox gave us our assignments um, really kind of early in the winter season. It was sometime past January or February. I can't remember exactly what time it was. So we kind of knew who we would be doing at least in the group stage and so we could watch uh, you know different tournaments if we wanted to we could go back and, and watch the archived games if we wanted to but I wanted to try to do a bulk of that um, before the tournament began and, and thankfully at the end of softball season um, which was you know after maybe the first week in May first couple weeks in May um, that that last like two and a half weeks in the month of May um, every day I did something for the World Cup if not two or three things and I actually had to create a calendar calendar today's italy day tomorrow is brazil day (laughs) you know wednesday um is another day is germany day and so i literally had to kind of structure myself in that way because frankly alex i was the kind of student that would write a paper in the 11th hour so to to try to prepare and, and and 
and get a schedule going that far in advance was a little bit challenging. That makes two of us. I was definitely a procrastinator. I would like wait till the morning that something was due and wake up super early and, and get it done and as opposed to the, even the night before. So I, I took procrastinating to the extreme. Um, but yeah, I de- <laughs> definitely want to uh, get deeper into the intricacies of calling a World Cup and of this particular event and your experience uh, in these last few weeks in just a second here. But but first, I want to do something that I, I do with a lot of guests on the show and kind of learn more about the path to this point in your career, um, which is clearly in a great spot considering the, the call that you got to do this event. But um, so I want to start at the beginning and, and going into your background, I looked on your website and the, the main quote that's at the top of your site says uh, that I was never... I was taught to never say no to an opportunity. So I'm just curious where that quote comes from and how early in your life uh, did you start applying that mantra to to your career and opportunities? Well, I, well the quote came from me um, just because I learned that, you know, when I graduated college, and, I, and I, I don't know if all college graduates had the same mindset and mentality that I had, but you frankly think that you're probably better and, and more equipped for a better job than what you really are. And so I, I graduate college and everybody, you know, at the time, uh, you know, Sports Center is, is the big show. And uh, so, you know, I, I grew up wanting to be an anchor on Sports Center because that's what everybody watched. And that's what I watched when I was growing up. So I thought, you know, I'm I'm good enough to do that. Well, you know, I wasn't. And and so I learned that you got to take steps and, and you have to say um, yes to some of the grunt jobs and, and yes to some of the, the jobs that are sometimes on the bottom rung of the ladder. And then you work your way up. And so I began applying for jobs at local news affiliates. And um, a lot of them I had, I didn't have a sports tape, I had a news tape. So I was applying for sports jobs with a news tape. And a lot of news directors were saying, well, I I don't know if you can talk sports. I don't know what your sports background is. You say you play, but how am I going to know that you'd be credible on the air? And so it was really hard for me to find my first job, which I eventually did in Alpena, Michigan. And it basically at the time was like the second smallest market in the country. And I never wanted to take that job because, again, I thought I was better than what I was. And then I realized after talking to so many people and how many people actually, frankly, even started out in Alpena, Michigan, and then were working in bigger markets in Detroit and New York and Chicago. And they all kind of told me and advised me. They said, it's not where you start. It's where you finish. And this will be a great opportunity for you to get your feet wet, to, for you to get your foot in the door. And then you kind of do with the opportunities as they come. And so I really took that advice to heart. And as I progressed, um, you know, I started out for 12 years, the first 12 years in local news. I started out in Alpena. I moved my way into the CBS affiliate, WLNS in Lansing, Michigan. And from there, I started to realize that kind of philosophy is that you have to say yes to opportunities that come your way. And, And it doesn't matter if it's a smaller opportunity than what you want. And it doesn't matter if it's a bigger opportunity where you might not think that you're ready for it. You make yourself ready for it and you learn and you grow um, within that opportunity and, uh, and step by step and baby steps and being patient and working hard. And, and sometimes you get an opportunity like calling the World Cup eventually. Yeah, how about that? And uh, backing up a little bit, you mentioned that maybe early on people would question your credibility or knowledge of sports, um, but you alluded to it a little bit. You were two-sport athlete at Northwestern playing soccer and basketball. I'm just curious, uh, which sport were you better at, would you say, um, you know, if you had to pick between the two? <laughs> I think actually soccer came easier to me, uh, but I focused more on basketball, if that can make sense. Uh, you know, I had just had a – my dad was my basketball coach, and, and for whatever reason, I think I, I gravitated more towards that. I always had a love for soccer, and I always felt just being an athlete, I think it came a lot easier for me. And basketball, I had to work a lot harder at it. I played AAU basketball, and I, I didn't play, like, travel soccer, even though I ended up playing at the collegiate level. Um, I, I think that's just an example of, you know, just kind of being able to understand Understand the game and feel the game a little bit and um, for whatever reason I just I, I put more time in, in, into anything and my parents were great in the fact that they weren't the parents that made me specialize so when I was growing up I played soccer and basketball and softball and I was in dance and I did tennis and swimming and all that stuff and then they let me choose when I got to high school of what sports I wanted to play and it really came down to softball versus soccer because they were going on in at the high school level in Michigan they're going on during the same season and I eventually chose soccer uh just because I, I felt like there was more there's too much standing around <laughs> in softball at the time um and I just had more of a passion I think for soccer at the time than I did softball well you couldn't have known it at the time but the soccer experiences 
paying off big time now um, for sure. You talked about you know moving eventually up the ladder and working in a mid-sized market in a place like uh, Lansing. What would you say your break was into the national level, like the BTN sort of level, and how, how did that come about? I think it was just being at the right place at the right time. I was in a Big Ten market. As you mentioned, I was working at the CBS affiliate in Lansing, Michigan, and the year was 2007, and that was the first year that Big Ten Network was starting. And so as, as year number one, and remember, it's not just year number one of, of a conference network like the SEC network or the Pac-12 network or soon to be the ACC network where they kind of have a blueprint to go off of. The Big Ten Network was the first to do whatever they were doing. And so they were looking for people. They were looking for uh, just announcers. They were looking for producers. They were looking for production staff, those behind the scenes. And um, they they hadn't really built a a foundation and now it's much different. But they were looking for any anyone who's willing um, and and capable of helping them out. And I just happened to be at a Big Ten city at the right place at the right time. They offered me a a sideline football job. That was the very first job I ever did for Big Ten Network. And I worked that very first weekend, the opening weekend, the App State Michigan weekend is the way it's been laid labeled now and uh i worked in northwestern game um ironically and uh they they were so searching for equipment and stuff because i think there was eight games going on that that day on that saturday almost simultaneously and so they were low on equipment and and choices and so my microphone was actually a wired microphone which is kind of unheard of now for sideline reporters and and that's not the case anymore but on that first weekend that that was exactly the case Um, my ifb was wired and my microphone was wired and so i couldn't really have the freedom to move around on the the sideline as much as i wanted to and i had no idea what i was doing and so it was that was literally really a trial by fire, but I think I worked hard enough. I, I brought a couple story ideas. My producer was Steve Johnson and I brought a couple story ideas to him and, and I think he saw my work ethic and my desire to do well and I, I think he just passed along a good word and, and and the rest is history. Yeah, and having been with BTN since literally day one in various roles, doing sideline all those years, did it ever cross your mind that you might eventually become the first woman to do a play-by-play football game for BTN and, and just really one of a few that have ever done it nationwide? No, I mean, play-by-play really wasn't on my radar uh, to start. You know, I when I grew up, I, I talked about, you know, I wanted to be an anchor for Sports Center just because, only because that was just the biggest show at the time when I was a kid. Well, when I also watched games, I'm, I'm kind of unusual as being an announcer now because I think you find a lot of announcers who watch games when they were kids and they say, I knew at seven years old or eight years old that I wanted to be an announcer. Well, at seven years old and eight years old, little Lisa thought that she was watching a game and she thought she could be like the, the actual player playing on the, the field or the court, not the, not the announcer talking about the player. And so when I got to college and, and I became a journalism major and then I realized, you know, playing basketball and soccer, it was great and it was awesome to play at the division one level. But I realized I wasn't good enough to play professionally. And eventually I had to realize that I wasn't going to be that player professionally that the announcers were talking about. But I still wanted to be in and around sports. And so I thought journalism was a great avenue. I thought broadcasting was a great avenue. And so that in itself is just how I got involved in broadcasting. The whole play-by-play thing actually was offered to me. It's not something that I pursued initially. Uh, One of the bosses at, at Big Ten Network had called and said, look, we're looking, again, we're looking for some people. And we have this Michigan State women's basketball game. They're taking on Indiana. And I know it's right in your backyard since you're in Lansing. We'd like to give you a try as a play by play. Would you be interested? And and I remember I was actually walking into the camera room of our local news station because as a local reporter, you shoot your own stuff. You pick up the camera and you put it on your shoulder and you cut your highlights and everything. So I was in the midst of doing all that. And when I was talking to him on the phone, I didn't really know what play by play meant because I hadn't really watched a game from that side of it. And so I said yes, because again, you go with the, the mantra of you say yes to any opportunity. I didn't really know what I was saying yes to. And, and now I've completely fallen in love with it. And now, now when I, when I watch games, I try to watch as many games as I can. I try to watch Kevin Kugler, um, Brian Anderson of Turner. Uh, Mike Tirico has always been a favorite of mine. Um, Tom Hart, who used to work for Big Ten Network, um, who has since moved on. I, those are some of my favorites. And I will literally sit and watch. And, but frankly, I don't care who's doing the game. But now I do watch to try to take notes of what the announcers do, how they say, how they control the moment, how they interact with the analyst. And now I absolutely love the role of play-by-play. 
yeah, you mentioned Kevin and Brian, a couple of friends of the pod, a couple uh, former guests on the show, and I enjoy watching them as well. Um, so, you know, you kind of talked about it and talked us through it there, but as, as your um, role at the network has, has grown, so has the, the network's partnership and our partnership with Fox and, and kind of our um, absorption under their umbrella. So, so when did your uh, involvement with Fox grow and I've seen you on some FS1 games for basketball this past year and obviously now with the World Cup when, when did that partnership come about I think it was along the same lines um, of what you were just talking about there's there's a renewed commitment and, and a contractual agreement um, between Fox and, and the Big Ten Conference and you know Fox also does stuff with the Big East as well and so actually one of um, my very first sideline opportunities was uh a game on Fox. It was a, a Big East men's basketball game, and I did sideline, and and so that's kind of grown from there. But 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 definitely, I see an increased partnership in terms of just the communication with management um, in Los Angeles and Chicago when you're working with Fox and Big Ten Network, and it's awesome to see because you feel like you're a part of a family now. There's a lot of sharing of the talent now. There's a lot of sharing of the production staff now, and I think there will be even more of that as, as the years go on. So, you know, again, one sideline opportunity grows into something else, and um, they knew that I was doing play-by-play as well, and so they've given me opportunities on both sides. When I say both sides, I mean Big Ten Network and Fox and FS1. So, um, so it's been great. It's been a great partnership. I love seeing uh, the, the Ohio State Michigan football game on Fox instead of ABC now. I think it's awesome. And, uh, and it's just an example of how things are changing just across the television landscape in terms of network affiliations and conference affiliations. And it's, it's kind of an unpredictable world, but I'm happy to be part of the Fox family. Yeah, I know what you mean. I always like seeing the Big Ten promos on, like the World Series and, and Fox uh, NFL Sunday and stuff like that. It's kind of a cool, um, cool affiliation for sure to have. And yeah. and circling back to the World Cup now, with this opportunity for you personally, is, is it something that was brought to to you and brought to your attention, or, or did you pursue it? How, how did this come about? Yeah, David Neal, who's in in, in charge of soccer at Fox, uh, wrote me an email and said he'd like to talk to me about possibly doing the World Cup. And so um, so we had a conversation about it, and this actually was about a year and a half, maybe. Um, yeah, I think it was about a year and a half ago um, from this point. So, um, so it was a considerable time ago. But uh, he just reached out and asked, and we talked about it. And, and I have a lot of soccer friends in and around uh, Fox who have actually done it before, um, you know, either on the production side or announcers. And um, obviously as a soccer fan, obviously as a former college soccer player, it's always been an event that I've loved to watch. And, um, of course, I was going to say yes. <laughs> there was I didn't really have to think twice. Uh, it, it literally just – I just waited for David Neal to just make the offer, and I immediately said yes because it's an incredible – opportunity it's one of the best if not the best events um, in the world and in america here especially with as good as the united states team is and so it's just it's an honor it's it's i've been waiting for it for a while (laughs) it wasn't announced until you know i think a few months before the event obviously but uh, i've been excited to get going and it's been a lot of work uh, but it's also been just a lot of fun and, and i'm so grateful for the opportunity So I watched the China versus South Africa game you called, uh, I believe it was last Thursday. And just on the surface, in a game like that, you know, the the linguistic challenges of calling a game like that with so many different pronunciations of names, does something like that take take extra preparation to familiarize yourself with the rosters? Or is it, you know, once you get to the World Cup where it could be any number of countries you're covering, is it all kind kind of the same? Alex, yes. Let me say that again. Yes, it takes a ton of time. I mean, you have, like on the South Africa side, uh, Ode Fulutudilu. That's an actual name. Right. And then on the China side, uh, you know, they have they have the different nuance of the name where you say the last name first, and then you say the first name last. Mm-hmm. So last name's Wong, first name's Shuang, you know. And, and if you have a couple of Wongs, which China has, so literally there's a sequence of like Wang Shuang to Wang Shang Shang to Li Ying to, you know, and so you have to get into a rhythm. And when I, I have to be honest, when I was first studying China, I thought the retention of these names, it's not coming. To- and so I went old school, like grade school. And I went back to when my mom and my dad would, would, would test me for my multiplication tables and they would do flashcards. <laughs> so that's, and that's, 
that's how I studied for South Africa versus China is I used flashcards for both teams. So I would write down, you know, you know, number number eight is Pulu Tutilu and, and I would write the name on the back and I would write like maybe one or two different notes that I wanted to memorize about that player. So I wouldn't have to like look down at my notes or my boards and cheat and say, what did I want to say about Wong Shuang? Like I knew it, it was ingrained in my brain. So I did that for both South Africa and I did it for China. But you're absolutely right in the fact that it's almost double the prep. Because not only are you prepping for the actual team and just their history and some of the bio stuff about all the players, which you do, frankly, for all the teams. The second part, there's an added layer to um, to complicated names. So you add that extra layer of not only studying the team, but now you have to study the names. And uh, there weren't many Smiths or Browns <laughs> as, as my, my parents were watching that game. And, and that's what my, my dad had texted me later. He said, there weren't many uh, simple names in that in that match. And I said, no, dad, there weren't. But, uh, but it was quite an accomplishment. I'm, I'm telling you, I felt like I had accomplished something after that match and in, in, uh, in getting that done. Yeah, it was a great watch. And, and like I said I can't imagine first of all you know the prep that goes into calling a soccer game between two American teams but then once you introduce all the uh, different intricacies uh, of those cultures and names and and pronunciations like it's it's hard to hard to imagine but you pulled it off uh it was fun to watch and I want to talk a little bit more about the broadcast and to do that gonna have to get a little technical because it's an aspect of these world cup broadcasts that I feel like not a whole lot of people know about um I'm calling you right now. You're actually not in France. You're calling the games um, from Los Angeles and, and from a remote studio. And I th- uh, only a couple of, of Fox crews are actually in France. The rest are with you in L.A. They did the same thing for the Men's World Cup last year. And it's something that actually Big Ten Network, a, a protocol that B- BTN kind of pioneered with the remote studios for the play-by-play and uh, color team, and you've called plenty of games from a studio just coming up through BTN. So can you take me through the process of calling a soccer game from a remote studio in, in L.A. when the game's being played six, 7,000 miles away? Yeah, it's it, it definitely um, – there are some different challenges to it for sure. And But like you had said, I think we're in a world now where more sports, frankly, are um, being called off of a monitor. And you're right, um, Big Ten Network was one of the first to do it. So to give people an idea, there are there are two broadcast crews that are in France, and um, and then there are three broadcast crews um, who are in LA. So there's there's five total broadcast teams, and then three in Los Angeles. Um, I will say this that. Uh, some of the advantages of being in Los Angeles is I look at some of my colleagues um, and follow them on social media and, and they're hopping on trains and planes and automobiles from one French city to another French city. And so in that way, it eliminates our travel. You know, we, we all are doing an incredible amount of prep. And, uh, but what we do in Los Angeles is we don't have to travel from one city to the next. And so that's actually very advantageous in terms of being here. Um, you know, they, they do a good job in terms of like the setup of it. And um, it, everyone has the same world feed. And so that's something that's actually different from the games that I've called with Big Ten Network, where we have actually access to all the different camera angles, and we can actually control what replays we see. And I don't know if many people understand that. But when you're doing the world feed, and I, I'm talking about everyone from, you know, the BBC to Fox and America here to whoever else is, is broadcasting it, we all get the same feed. We all get the same replays. We all get the same looks. It's just the different announcers to put words to the pictures. And that's the difference from one country to the next. So we don't know sometimes when a replay is coming up. Or, for example, let's say we get into a conversation about a, a controversial play and we have a rules analyst. And let's say we want to bring her in one more time. Well, it would only make sense to maybe like show a replay of that controversial play again. And we just don't have the freedom or the latitude to do that. So you just have to adjust accordingly in, in that way. Um, but, you know, we have access. We, we, we sit on headset and, and we listen to the studio show pre, post game, halftime. So we're all kind of connected in that way. We have some studio, as, as, as you probably have seen when you watch the coverage, some studios in France and actually some studios in Los Angeles. Um, so we have studio kind of divided as well. 
but uh, it, it's nice in the setup that they have and that we're all kind of connected. So I could see, for example, I just I, I did a match today and, um, you know, Brazil's Cristiani had scored a couple of, of headers in this tournament. And I watched Alexi Lalas kind of break down her the headers that she scored in the World Cup. And because they have that connection, because we're able to watch, um, you know, we can still reference that during the match if we want. Um, but but those are some of the advantages and, and disadvantages between being in Los Angeles and being in France. Right, and I doubt there's anyone that, uh, or many people that have more experience calling off a monitor in, in a remote location than you have, just like I mentioned, with BTN um, kind of pioneering that method. But I'm curious, how difficult is it to identify the players on a screen when just like a soccer pitch is so huge? I feel like soccer is way more challenging than some other sports you've called, like softball or basketball in that regard. Just just seeing the numbers and seeing who each player is in such a you know vast playing field how does how does that work well my favorite players become the ones like megan rapino who actually like dye their hair red <laughs> right <laughs> so they stand out um amongst everybody else there are some challenges to it um, um frankly there are but you know frankly there are some challenges actually in being on site too because you might not um be able to see even though you're there you actually might not get the right angle even though you're there and um, and so you don't always just because you're not there doesn't mean you don't always get the right angle. You know, um, there are challenges with that, with with even soccer and football sometimes where you have to go from the live action on the field to the monitor to try to make sure that you get the call right. Make sure you ID the player appropriately. Um, but, you know, what I do is I, I go back and I, I watch games. And so I, I try to identify little nuances, um, just something as simple as. You know, that outside back is wearing orange shoes or or this midfielder um, has a, a headband on, you know, just little indicators like that. I think that help. But I, I go back to the flashcards. You know, if, if you can see the number and sometimes you can't always, but if you can see the number, um, you know, number to name, number to name, number to name. And you just kind of drill it in your brain. Um, sometimes you can't identify them as quickly as you want. And that's OK, because it happens to everyone people who are on site and people who aren't on site. Um, but as long as you get the call right at the end, that's all that matters. Yeah, I think people don't realize, like I've seen some radio setups at some events that are maybe at a football stadium, like the Final Four, where they're oh, all yeah, the way they're in, the, they're in the corner. And I don't know how they see anything up there. So it's, you know, like you said, there are Kevin, yeah, there are drawbacks to being on site too, yeah. Takes, uh, you know, he's, he's famous for his stadium picks, right, on his Twitter. Mm-hmm. And some of the perspectives that he does with the Westwood one radio for Sunday night football. And, and some of the, the booths that he has to sit in is, is exactly that. It's exactly what you're describing. It's like far back in a corner. And I'm thinking if the action is going away from you, that cannot be easy to call. So it's not just, are you on site or off site? It's really kind of, can you get the angle? And, and sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. And if you can't, it's okay. Um, you can make a, a, you can stall a little bit or what they have is like kind of a delayed call. And that's okay because everybody does it. Um, it, it it's not a, a mistake to do that at all. Um, so it, it happens to all of us and it's just kind of getting through the moment and, and it's fine. But it, I'll tell you what though, the LA weather, is, is pretty good. It's uh, It's been much better summer weather than Chicago from what I've seen with some of my friends and following them on social media. Yeah, it's a nice day today, but lately the weather is, has uh, stunk. It's been like gloomy, gray, 50 degrees. So uh, I don't feel too bad for you that you're not in France because LA is probably a close second. <laughs> it's not a bad place to be for a month. I'll say that. Uh, Lisa, before I let you go, I'm going to put you on the spot for one more question, and I just want to use your expertise and, and uh, consumption of all these games to share mm-hmm. something about the World Cup that maybe you've observed or that you've enjoyed personally that maybe the average fan might not know uh, or even consider since, you know, if you're a soccer fan like me, I'm tuning in once every few years to these big events. So what's something about covering soccer and covering the World Cup that is unique or um, special to you in particular? I think it's just the passion and the joy that you feel. Um, It's everything. Like, I get goosebumps every time I do a match, and I think I've done, like, nine or ten now. And and every time we, we start out the match kind of in the same way. And we started out, you know, just just showing the teams in the tunnel right before the procession. And I get goosebumps because FIFA and and this world feed, and they do an incredible job of of tight 
close-up shots and sometimes some slow-mo replays where it just captures either you can feel the player's confidence you can sense their anxiousness or their their nervousness and and i just love to feel the emotion of the sport um let alone just the brilliance on the field and the kind of athletes that that all these players are it's amazing um there's some incredible stories jamaica making it for the first time i got to call south africa making it for the first time and 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 when you hear about their qualification stories and the fact that they were crying on the field when they realized they were going to get to this moment and this stage for the first time it's incredible and you contrast that with the united states and how excellent they are and and the passion that and, and maybe it's once every four years maybe it's once every two years if you throw in the olympics but people pay attention to this team and it's it's a very special team um i still think that they're great role models out there on that team and, and for little girls especially who want to be strong women i think that's an incredible story to watch um you have incredible talents outside of the united states i just got to call uh, marta's goal that set the all-time World Cup record, um, either on, on the men's side or the, the women's side. She has 17 for the World Cup. So you have stars like that that are even outside the United States that just that really give you goosebumps and just watching them play because you know you're literally watching the greatest soccer players in the world and, in Marta's case, in the history. Absolutely. Well, Lisa, we will uh, continue to watch over the next few weeks as uh, the World Cup rolls on here on Fox and we'll continue to watch your work. I appreciate you taking some time, making some time for this podcast during a uh, very busy time and and, uh, seminal moment in your career. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me on. I I appreciate it. And uh, go USA. Absolutely. Red, white, and blue. All right. Once again, can't thank Lisa enough for taking some time out of her busy prep and announcing schedule to get on the phone and do that interview. Really appreciate it. And uh, it's always fun catching up with her. All right, now we'll kick it over to Colleen Degnan, our producer, for her weekly Call for the Culture segment, where we have a uh, about a 30-minute casual discussion about everything in between the intersections of sports, pop culture, entertainment, social media, whatever it may be. Uh, we'll get to it, current events, all that good stuff. And that's going to start right now. So let's kick it over to Colleen and Call for the Culture. All right, we're back in the lab with another edition of Call for the Culture. Alex Rue here alongside Colleen Degnan. Colleen, how's it going? Hi, Alex. I'm doing well. What's up? Not a lot. Um, we're kind of in that zone of uh, summertime where things are slow around the office, aside from Michigan baseball and their magical run that they're on right now. So props to them. Uh, go blue the rest of the, the, rest of the uh, College World Series here. But, yeah, it's pretty slow around here. Um, one thing that's coming up is the NBA draft, so that's kind of – pulling my attention away from, you know, articles online and other distractions that have been taking up my day. I don't know what's been going on with you or if you have uh, anything to share, anything new coming across your plate lately. I just find it so funny. Obviously, I'm very biased towards the league, so I love all the NBA drama, but with now we have, yeah, the draft coming up on Thursday and then all of the drama and the deadline deals and the trades this past weekend. I think the Raptors got to, like, live in their glory for maybe 24 hours before they were old news yeah. and nobody's even talking about that. Yeah, we can talk about the Raptors and the NBA championship in a second, but you're right, the shine was definitely stolen a little bit by Anthony Davis and the trade to the Lakers um, and all the kind of speculation and, and chatter about what the Pelicans got back. And, and you're right, it was funny, but... Getting back to the NBA draft, which, like you said, has come up Thursday. Um, I think this is this episode is going to come out Thursday. So today, if you're listening on the first day, uh, I don't know about you, but I t- personally enjoy the NBA draft a lot more than the NFL draft. Absolutely agree. Why is I, that? I think I just pay attention better to college basketball than I do college football holistically. So, like, I know more of the players, I'd say, going to, like, all of the teams versus, like, honing in on just maybe, like, the standouts of football. Well, it's a numbers game, right? I yeah. mean, there's so many fewer players that you have to, to know and keep track of. There's only two rounds in the NBA draft, which I like. Right. 60 players or Efficient. whatever getting drafted. It's one night instead of three. Yep. I will say the NFL draft, which we talked about a couple months ago, has done a much better job, I think, making it into an enjoyable event as opposed to just an X's and O's straight-up football production. But in the NBA draft, like you said, we know these guys' faces. We know their personalities for the most part. 
in a year like this where there's a transcendent talent like Zion Williamson, it's going to be captivating TV. So I'm looking forward to it. Are you Are you someone who watches the NBA draft? Or you just kind of follow along on Twitter? A hundred percent this year I'll be watching just based off of, like you said, the drama around Zion and why there's like so many last minute like teams trying to trade up to get better spots. I think it's mm-hmm. going to be really entertaining. Pelicans have two picks in the top four. Yeah. Number one and four. Um, they got that Lakers pick and I've complained about it in past episodes, but I'll, I'll have to watch for my Bulls to get their number seventh pick for the three years and <laughs> third year in a row. Um, you know, begrudgingly, I'll, I'll watch that and see That's who they okay. take that will end up being like a average player for seven years in the Bulls. Go in more optimistically. All right, maybe yeah, maybe this is the year they find this like could be your the year. next Steph Curry or the next Draymond or like you know somebody who's you undervalued. Know. Exactly. Speaking of Steph Curry and Draymond, let's, let's address it because we kind of talked about the NBA playoffs throughout. The entire postseason as and the unofficial podcast yeah, for the Blazers. Yeah, it'd be fitting. It would. It would uh, not be fitting unless we kind of put a bow on that and wrapped it up. Um, finals are over. Raptors got it done. Drake gets his his ring. So yeah, you're a culture father. Happy right. culture father's shout day, to Drake. Happy Father's Day, Drake. Belated uh, to my dad. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that the Raptors got it done. We talked about how being how we were kind of sick of. The Warriors and their reign of terror. Although I kind of hated how it ended. A little ended. bittersweet. I really didn't. Injuries. I didn't love it at all. How did you? What did you take away? I guess from from your viewing experience because I only saw the last two or three games being out of the country for the first few. So what, what did you think? There overall? was just so many injuries, and it just came down to a, t- a, a Golden State team that clearly wasn't their healthiest. So everyone's always going to chalk this up as well. If they were all healthy, it would have been different. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say though that the Cavaliers, a few of those years when they played the Warriors, were not 100 percent either. So totally fair. Kind of came just, back around for for Golden State. You're right. You'd rather not see, obviously. That's the thing. I Kevin mean, now Durant. you just kind of feel bad for KD and Clay Thompson. And Clay Thompson. Right, but. I also kind of wish they would have won it at home, closed it out, yeah. um, instead of blowing it and, and winning on the road. There's something about winning at home that just makes the viewing experience as a neutral fan much more enjoyable for me. Like, I like seeing the home crowd get into it. It's always kind of a muted celebration on the road. But still, there was enough drama and, and NBA Twitter hijinks that I think it still kept it entertaining, like, you saw Kawhi's reactions. He has kind of become a meme in himself, just being oh my gosh, such yeah. a unique figure. Um, you know, we talked about Drake and just the refreshing nature of a team like uh, Toronto winning it with kind of the whole country on, on their back. Did you see Jurassic Park, how exciting it was? Absolutely. I was going to say that. I mean, you want to be happy for a city like Toronto, too, who, like, really put it all behind them. Well, what I liked was um, the other Jurassic Parks springing up, like the mini ones in other cities. Like, I don't know if you saw it in Rockford, Illinois, which is you know an hour and a half from here, and kind of a, a town that's had a tough time um, in the hometown last few decades. Of, hometown of Fred yeah. Van Vliet, they had their own Jurassic Park spring up, and you have a bunch of people you know that it's geographic geographically irrelevant as opposed uh, compared to Toronto that we're all cheering for the Raptors, and you would think that it was in Toronto if you saw the footage. So so that was cool, you know, that a completely different city was kind of on that bandwagon and got to enjoy. NBA uh, championship experience. Absolutely. So, good job. Good job, Raptors. Um, and, and kind of piggybacking on the new championship team, the fresh look for a, a championship team. We don't talk much much NHL, but the Blues got it done, too. They got the Stanley Cup. So, Would you have some ties, too? Distant ties? Yeah, I, I kind of came day. up on the Blues growing up, um, so I'm glad they got it done. I'm a Blackhawks fan now, but it was cool to see them get the Stanley Cup, especially... You know, I'm I'm on the record saying I can't stand St. Louis Cardinals fans, so I'll <laughs> pretend that, that 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 the vast majority of Cardinals and Blues fans don't overlap. But it was cool, you know, to see like for a city that has also been down on its luck in certain regards, and a city that's had its NFL team move out and kind of had the rug pulled out from under them in that regard to to be lifted up a little bit by a team that has never reached that mountaintop before. So and cool. also, I'm such a sucker for compelling, heartfelt stories, so obviously I was following the Layla story. Yeah, Layla, Layla's great. Um, I don't know her exact disease, I'd have to look it up. It's a rare disease, right. and, and she's the Blues have done a great job bringing um, their you know fans that have, had, that have had some misfortune and some unfortunate... Uh, and she was health battles and, and Layla, you know, got to go to the game in yeah. Boston and she's kind of been in there every step of the way. And uh, actually a pretty eloquent speaker for being such a young little I'm always amazed girl. that those kids like I said the same thing when Tyler Trent right. was doing his interviews. Like it's amazing how composed they are 
under pressure speaking to media and stuff. You know, they're not trained in that, but they're no. they're super, you know, usually composed and good. It's almost like, you know, for those those kids that have been through that, it's like what kind of pressure comes along with speaking on TV? I've already faced like this deadly you know, demon, and, and now, right. like, what's, you know, what's gonna, and I'm, and I'm supposed to be scared of a, a microphone? No, I don't no. think so. And that's just, like, also coming off of uh, the U.S. Open this weekend with Gary winning. He also had a special tie to a... See, I wasn't, I didn't catch up on that story. I had heard, like, whispers or, or just, like, kind of in the periphery of it, um, flipping back and forth. What was the story with Gary Woodland? He... Did he lose a kid? N- uh, well... Yes, but that that's not really what they're highlighting on. He has, he has, like, really close ties to this little girl who has, like, special needs as well. And so right. like, she's been just, like, somebody that he's been playing for and, like, keeping in contact with. And she was on, like, Good Morning America this morning, and he oh. surprised her there. And That's great. It's I just love when the athletes, they have so much power to make a difference. And when they actually do, I'm just so proud of yeah, them. Yeah, that's the type of stuff that never gets old. And, you know, it, it's, it's something that no matter – what it is like golf or hockey um there's always going to be some passionate fans out there who you know might have like we said the misfortune of of falling on hard times health wise or financially whatever it might be that that when these teams or organizations or athletes can reach out and lift them up it's always fun to see it never gets old and i did kind of hear about that but i didn't know the whole backstory so so that was great i was very happy to see him win yeah and you bring up golf and and now we're in this kind of time of year with nba and NHL being over, that our attention turns to some of those, I won't say fringe sports, but... You know, hey, golf is not a fringe sport to me. Yeah, I know, but like it's, it's one that you don't pay attention to week in and week out necessarily. And our attention also turns to, uh, to baseball full-time. There that's we one go. of the big four. It's the only big four sports still going right now <laughs> um, that's in season. So, you know, we'll have golf on certain weekends to pay attention to. The Women's World Cup, which we'll talk about in a second, but... I want to focus on baseball real quick because we haven't talked in depth about the major leagues or um, anything really beyond our our fandom for the Cubs on this podcast. And I'm curious, Colleen, having been around the country like you have, having grown up in a different part of the country, and having dabbled in different fan bases, what are some of your favorite ballparks to go to in Major League Baseball? Let's do a quick MLB ballpark roundup and list some of our favorites. Ooh, okay. Well, based on weather-wise, obviously I'm going to be biased to Dodger Stadium and uh, the Anaheim Stadium as well, just okay. because you're always guaranteed good weather, whereas here I feel like I'm yeah, no always rain-outs cold. There, really. No rainouts. It's never windy, and it's like never maybe going to snow once spring rolls around. Also, easier tickets, I feel like, out there. Like, Dodger Stadium's so big. Anaheim, obviously, isn't as well-attended, probably, so you can probably walk up and get a get a ticket. Yeah. I've never been and- to Dodger Stadium. That one's on my list. Really? Yeah, I have been to the Anaheim one, though. Chavez Ravine's a cool place, for sure. Um, Everyone can, loves it, like, that has talked about going there. It kind of makes me a little bit better, though, now having been to Miller Park, because Chavez Ravine is a similar setup, with, and it has so much parking outside mm-hmm. of it that if you could tailgate, it would definitely be, like, number one place to go, but you can't, which is just kind of, like... Why can't you? Because Miller Park is up there. I right, think Miller it's Park's a, made an attraction. It's so fun. First of all, you, they can close the roof. So good for them for understanding that they are the coldest state in America. Mm-hmm. Might as well make good purpose out of their Minnesota area. doesn't have a roof. Oh, Target Field. I haven't been to Target Field, but I want to go there. So Miller Park is another one I have not been to somehow. It's, really? it's right up the road. I'm going to try and get to one this summer, but it's, I've heard great things, especially like you said about the tailgating. Tailgating so fun. Yeah, and Miller Park and Dodger Stadium are two that I haven't. Um, haven't gotten around to going to, so I'll have to I'll have to get up there. But I mean, just to close out, sorry, my West Coast bias. Petco Park is also pretty sick because there's certain days that you can actually bring your dog or pet and sit in Fitting. the grassy field. Yeah, sponsors might as well lean into that. Yeah, angle. Uh, yeah. A couple of them on my list that I have not been to that I really want to. Um, besides the Azure Stadium, Miller Park, uh, PNC Park in Pittsburgh is, oh. is one that I've heard great things about, and have not got a chance to go. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other obvious ones. Oh, Safeco Field or if it's still T-Mobile, 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 T-Mobile Park. It's very Seattle. sick. That one's yeah. sick. Yeah, that, Obviously that Fenway. Cool. Fenway is just I've so been, historic. I've been to Fenway. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Just because I like the old fashioned same ballparks like Wrigley yeah, and I was going to say, obviously we're biased to Wrigley. Right. So um, some of the cool ones I have been to, uh, I think it's now called Oracle Park in, which was AT&T Park in San oh, Francisco. Nice. Uh, it's great views. Just a you know modern, clean overall you know, also it has some throwback yeah, aspects to it. Yeah, it's a good it. hybrid between Yeah, and just a great overall production with the Giants and having been great, you know, since 
the beginning of the millennium, really, and being a historic franchise. Um, okay. I'll admit, Bush Stadium's pretty cool in St. Louis. Like, okay. Overall, it's, <laughs> it, through gritted teeth, I say that. Uh, I mentioned Wrigley's one of my favorites. You talk about Target Field in Minnesota. Um, have you been? I have. We worked the, the MLB All Star Game in 2014 there. I was with a student group working, cool. so I kind of got behind the scenes access to Target Field. And it's a super nice park. It was brand new then. Um, it's really clean and modern. Great sight lines there. It is cold, I'm sure, a yeah. lot of the year, but we were there in summer. and Because it's in a great it really part, nice. of, part of Minneapolis. I so. mean, just right downtown. Yeah. It's, it's got a, a light rail stop right there, and it's convenient. Um, Camden Yards in Baltimore is one that I've, I've been to once. It's it's also very centrally located. And kind of, it was kind of the first ballpark, I think, to, to kind of um, – reinvigorate the whole old-timey baseball uh, feel and look of the stadium and bring it back into the architecture of it. Like, I think in the 70s and 80s, it was kind of the cookie-cutter parks that were all um, built up, like the old Bush Stadium and Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh. They were just kind of the donuts, I think they called them, the concrete okay, donuts. yeah, 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 yeah. So like, it kind of ushered back in the old, like, Ebbets Field style, and now you see AT&T Park like that, I think SunTrust Park. So what do you think you're Atlanta. more biased to? Do you appreciate it being super retro vintage, or do you like the new wave? I think, I think the balance modern. is like, well, you know, like the balance of it is like having the modern amenities, even lo- like Wrigley Field has done with kind of expanding the concourses a little bit, doing what they can to, to modernize the old feel of it so you know it's it's better i think when it has that touch of touch of modern with uh nods to to the past yeah as long as it's not cliche i hate when they try to go too far into like making it super old timey like i do want to go back to uh or i do want to not go back i want to check out denver of course yes of course would be sick that's another one um what am i leaving out are there any i've been to randomly the arizona diamondbacks was a really cool stadium never been i've so been there that's a good one yeah i like growing up playing volleyball we always had volleyball tournaments out there and it's obviously like over 100 degree heat yeah. so i feel like most often than not their their uh roof was closed yeah but it's still a really cool stadium yankee stadium you've been there no i haven't i have been to yankee stadium the new one not the old one it was cool it was like basically as people who know, you know, Yankees baseball, they know it's just a, a modern replica of the old one, kind of a bigger version. So it was neat. Um, I feel like I'm missing a couple. I, I haven't been to any of the Texas I ones. I think I've been to City Field when I was a youngster. And uh, the other New York one, Mets. See the Mets, yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Um, Detroit. I have been to You've the Tiger Stadium, Comerica Park, or whatever it's called. Yeah, it was. it's another one of those, like, kind of – modern um versions of of a throwback i think it's the only one it's either it's either chase field in arizona or detroit it's comerica that has the the line all the way from the infield uh, from the pitcher's mound to home plate one of them still has that i can't remember which but that's that's like a real throwback like you never see that anymore with the, the dirt um streak going from home to the pitcher's mound so fun wow okay all this talk i'm actually getting pretty pumped i know all Hopefully, right. i'm a little more season. into baseball yeah. season <laughs> Cubs and White Sox play right yeah. now uh, tonight and tomorrow. So good chatter in the office. That's energizing about that. the city. There's For a lot sure. of Sox fans in the office, which like tons. You know, you don't realize you are around so many Sox fans, but but I will give guaranteed rate their food at their stadium rocks. Yeah, guaranteed rate's always a good time because like, and it's super clean. Yeah, it's, it's got good cheap food. Um, you they know, if the White fireworks. Sox get better, it, it might not always. <laughs> I'm a big fireworks guy at, at sporting I'm a big events. Fireworks like girl. I think fireworks make. Sporting events so much more fun. I get so fascinated. That's it's the, so fun. That's the biggest thing I'm jealous of. That the guaranteed rate has that Wrigley Field does not is the fireworks. Um, I totally agree. I think football games are better with fireworks. Yeah. If you can get them in a basketball game, just like, anything. All the fireworks, like just make it so extra. Seriously, make it so fun. Any any pyrotechnics explosion, <laughs> it enhances the game experience. So not pyros over here. Just appreciate the right amount. <laughs> all right, so we've got. The summer baseball talk. Let's let's kind of blend a couple of topics here, talking about summer sports and our summer habits. Because um, we briefly touched on it earlier, but the Women's World Cup is going on. So uh, entertaining. Our parent station, Fox. So we've got some ties to, to some of the broadcasters and obviously the whole operation that's underway at Fox to broadcast these games from France. And the U.S. team already secured their round in 16. So yes, so not great. a surprise there, but that a group play. Let's let's bundle this into a discussion about what uh, our summer habits are and and what we tend to do, and, and if like you know, I'm trying to just feel out if we both are uh, tending to 
to adopt these habits in the summer because I don't know about you, but when the uh, kind of buffet of sports goes away that mm-hmm. I watch, like basketball, football, and hockey, and, you know, it's just baseball out there, I tend to, to broaden my horizons yeah. and, and watch different sports. So, like, the World Cup has been on in my desk. Um, I, I know you're a fan. You, you, you like to watch. Do you, do you also tend to you know, broaden your scope a little bit and, and watch other sports? Like, do you find yourself flipping to soccer or to maybe, like, the cornhole tournament that's on certain channels? Is that something that you, you do, or do you just kind of ride it out and watch hard knocks and, and football documentaries and wait for football I season? think I've randomly started watching a little bit of lacrosse. I'm not going to lie, but, like, that's just... Yeah, lacrosse is another one because they have the Premier League yeah. lacrosse on. So, but, no, more so I'd say... So we're really lucky getting two years back-to-back with World Cups. Right. Like, although the men's team wasn't in it last year, still, I find it so entertaining. But, now we're gonna, um, about to go on a three-year drought. Right, so. which will be super rough for summer, uh-huh. summer programming. But I thought you are getting at more just summer activities. I mean, I feel like as much as possible I'm outside... Even though you know, it's yeah. not been ideal. Yeah. So when you're not watching sports, you're you're um, or like a lot enjoying of s- the weather when it's not 50 degrees yeah. like it's been in Chicago. Or yeah. enduring it in summer concerts in this. True. Or well, before we uh, get into some of the summer activities, I do need to ask you what you thought of the women's team running up the score on Thailand. I know this is like old debate by now. Like it, it was already kind of hashed out last week. But uh, just from your perspective, what did you think about the celebrations up like? 10-0, 11-0, 12, well, 13. Okay, the celebrations maybe weren't super necessary, but yeah. if for some freak thing happened where that other like the other teams in our group were to somehow score so many goals as well in other games and it came mm-hmm. down to goal differentiation, like we needed that. So, I mean, right, I don't it. have a problem with the goals. Um, but the celebrations could have probably been a little bit less, <laughs> but whatever, they're coming out as top dogs. It's something to... that no one will care about like as the tournament yeah. progresses. It was a hot talking point for the first um, game, obviously, and I saw the perspective of people who thought it was over the top. Um, but, you know, it's going to become such a backstory because they, they are probably going to make the final and, and at least go far in the tournament and, and likely win it. And, yeah, and, and we talked to Lisa Byington on this episode about what goes into broadcasting the World Cup and how big of an endeavor it is for uh, our parent company, Fox, and just how cool of an opportunity that is. So I think Fox is the World Cup rights, at least through 2026, win L.A. gets the World Cup, or the U.S. gets the World the U.S. Cup. U.S. with yeah. Canada and Mexico, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, so that that'll one. be cool, and that'll be a huge, and it seems so far away, but... It seems you know, so far away. Six That's going to be so cool to see which now. stadiums they hold it at. Right, it's going to be awesome. I feel like be Pasadena awesome. is a front runner. Like you, sure. I was bummed when the U.S. men did not yeah. make it last year. Um, but yeah, it'll be something to, to keep an eye on, and I'm sure um, we'll talk a little more Women's World Cup, because storylines will come out of that as the summer moves And along. I love how long it is. It's so entertaining. Yeah. Um... So back to it. Back to our summer habits and tendencies. I need to, to take your temperature here on certain um, activities, like you said, certain summer trends, taboos, topics. Like I, I wrote down a few here, a few do's and don'ts in the summer. And I just want to get your get your take on it. All right, give them to me. So let's start off with a a big hot topic of discussion in Chicago right now. The scooters. Hilarious. The scooters that are invading. Um, have you have you scootered? No, I've not. Well, it just came to, to Chicago. For right, people but who I don't mean know, in general. Yeah, for people who don't know, um, unless you've been living under a rock or haven't visited a big city in the last year or two. Don't these, be harsh. These bird and lime scooters um, have been popping up in, in cities all over the place, right? So you can, it's basically dockless scooters mm-hmm. that you can set up with your phone, pay for, rent out for a certain amount of time and, and, and use to get around in an environmentally fr- friendly and convenient way as opposed to, like, biking or taking a car. And, um, you know, I've seen them all over the place. I've seen them in California, Arizona, right. St. Louis, Indy, Washington, D.C., everywhere um, in the last year or so. And they're now coming to Chicago Just, within certain boundaries. Right. I was going to say, so I've only ever done it in Santa Monica, and Which is perfect for those things. Right. It's perfect, and it's been there for a lot longer. It's much more feasible. It can be there year-round. But, yeah, they just hit Chicago this past weekend on a four-month trial period, and there's, like, 10 competitors, 10 or 20 competitors. Is that many, really? Yeah, wow. it's I crazy. didn't know they were giving that many companies uh, a foot in the door here. And But like you said, it's just in certain parts of Chicago. Like, you and I don't get access, technically don't get yeah, access to Yeah, our streets them. are not part of it. And before even this trial period was announced, I, I'd – thought that the scooters would not come here because they wouldn't work like chicago's just like not weather-wise a, or it's what? Just, no no no. it's just not a city set up to handle 
oh, I another totally mode of transportation disagree with you. on the street. Like there's just not so okay, bikers are already in the way and that's already kind of a, a um hazard of I guess driving and, and transporting through through the city. Um the lakefront I don't think is set up to handle anything beyond the, the current bikers and joggers that are going on. I do think certain areas of the city away from downtown. Like, I don't think downtown's equipped to handle this at all. So. Well, they w- technically aren't allowing them in the loop. Exactly. But what's going to stop them? Like, well, I feel like people will undock because that's where people want to go is the, the loop. Well, it says that they won't work once you get to a certain parameters Okay, so they the shut city. them off. They apparently slow down. I mean, I haven't put them to the test. Right. But it would be super I, interesting. And I know a lot of people think it's, like, litter, essentially, around the city. That bothers me less. Drop them. Same. It bothers, yeah. doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. That, the It's convenient. The, right. The scooter's just sitting around bothers me less. Um, than the actual just like getting in the way and 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 you know motoring around in places where there's already a lot of congestion. It's I, also I saw a dude almost die on one in what? in Indianapolis. Uh, we were there for the Big Ten championship, and this dummy ran a red light, and a car almost like took him out. It was crazy. So yeah. I think that's going to happen a lot, especially if the scooters are going outside their their parameters. Horror stories. But I don't know about you, but I would be way more inclined to scooter than to divvy anywhere. Yeah, me too, probably. Uh, especially because the divvy, you have to dock, right? You so find inconvenient. A so, where, where are they? I don't know. Yeah, you never, I mean, it's you have to do much more planning when it comes to the shared bike system as opposed to scooters. So I'm in the anti-scooter camp for now. I could be swayed if it, if it proves me wrong and works out here in the city so that's my summer don't um oh wow you're saying a complete don't to the scooters i mean i can be swayed but i'm taking a preliminary nope on the scooters wow okay i hope it i hope the uh trial period fails and and they go away (laughs) so um but we'll see you know i have an open mind on it um another thing i'd written down for like okay give it to me summer yeah summer hot topic hot coffee what, is hot coffee acceptable in the summer? Absolutely. Some people have the seasons. They switch over from ice to hot. Oh, my God, no. Hot coffee, do or die. Forever. You, what about iced coffee? Do you drink iced coffee? Like, hardly. Really? Yeah. There's a lot of people that are, like, hardcore iced coffee fans and will drink iced coffee even in the winter. I Right, but I am the, just the opposite and drink hot coffee even in the summer. Same. I will drink hot coffee in the summer, although I think both are flexible, right? Like, I think you can indulge in a iced coffee in the winter and a hot coffee in the summer. I don't think there should be hard and fast rules here. I agree with that. I'm just saying if you're super addicted like myself, I you can't. It could be 115 degrees and I'll still have a hot coffee. Okay. I'm with you on that one. A couple more. How like about this. and I've always like questioned myself on this because I've done this before. Do or don't taking uh, a tropical or like beach vacation a faraway beach vacation. We're not talking like your lake house or like, you know, going up to Michigan for the weekend. Tropical vacation in the summer when you're like, you're going from a hot place to another hot place. Well, if you live in a climate like Chicago that apparently forgot what summer was, I would completely say do, do, do. Forget about that. Like say, (laughs) yeah, just say like your normal summer in, in July and you go to Florida or the Bahamas. Like, is that acceptable? I would say yes, just because it's still vacation. Right. That's when people can get off work. Right. It slows down, at least for us. We're in a st- lucky situation where yeah. we kind of are seasonal with the school academic calendar. So I would say yes, although I could see the argument of, like, why would you go somewhere when it's warm here? Exactly. But it's not vacation vibes. Exactly. We have a beach here, so it's a little different. Okay. Like, we can again, go to the beach here. It's not so like, really a beach. I know, but, like, it's at least we see a beach if we want. Like, some people don't get to see the beach if you're landlocked or... Um, you know, in, in a lot of the Big Ten footprint, to be honest. So, and you're like treating yourself. I think it's if you're a beach vacation person, you can take that. Don't be ashamed. I agree. It's just you definitely appreciate the climate less. Say if you're going down to Arizona or Florida or wherever, and you're going from 80 degrees here to 90 degrees there. You yeah, know, it's like it's, that's very it's much less of a aha epiphany moment when you step off the plane and you feel that warm air like it's just yeah that's true but it's not like anybody in the winter is like why are you going skiing it's it's snowing here yeah you know good point all right last one um and this one i just kind of made up with the top of my head but um what do you think about sitting inside the restaurant or bar when there's it's nice weather outside and there's like a patio or outdoor seating readily available right out there i would definitely pick the patio would you yeah so is it unacceptable to sit Inside? No, I feel like that's just realistic. There's not that many outdoor patios to go around. For the I think in Chicago, there's a lot. I mean, the most popular ones. You're right. You don't want to like. You don't want to pass by a good 
outdoor patio or setup. I situation. think actually, I think the summer is a really opportune time for a lot of restaurants that don't do that well if they have a patio to thrive. Right, because I would totally go to a place that I'd never been before if there was an outdoor spot. Yeah, very few things top a good patio, especially if you see people out there having a good time. And you could people watch. Exactly, exactly. It's just, I will say, I don't really enjoy eating outside, especially if really? it's like hot out. Because as soon as that food comes out, right, we know it's about getting your hot and issue. going bad. And I'm, I'm getting hot eating it and sweating. I'll, you know, any beverage I think is more refreshing outside and it's fun. But, you know, once food gets involved, I like sitting in a nice, cool, air-conditioned environment eating my salad or my sandwich or whatever. That is so 55-year-old man of you. <laughs> I'm just saying. And, I mean, I respect you. I completely would do the opposite and take outside any day. All right, Colleen. Well, maybe we can address <laughs> some more summer faux pas or I thought you were going to say, topics. we'll eat together, but you'll sit inside and I'll be 20 feet outside. And yeah, we can just, like, wave. We can do that, too. At the company picnic, maybe. <laughs> um, let's, bring, let's think of some more as we go along here and bring them up and, and debate them. Hash them out as the summer goes along. Love it. Sound good? I'll, br- I'll bring some hot topics next time. All right, cool. We'll wrap up today. Um, good discussion. I think we kind of have moved into a, a period of summer that will uh, challenge us to come up with new topics now that some of our tentpole you know, sports discussion topics are, are behind us. But I believe in us. I think we can do it. I think so, too. And hopefully, I, I'm going to say it now, happy official start of summer. Yeah. Because that's happening June this weekend, 21st. 21st. All right. Happy uh, summer solstice. solstice. Yeah. There we go. All right. Happy solstice. Everybody. All right. I'll talk to you next time. See ya. All right. Thanks once again to Lisa and Colleen for joining me this week. Learned a lot from Lisa. Enjoyed that conversation. I uh, had fun as always chopping it up with Colleen. And I hope you guys had fun listening to it as well. Uh, Thanks, as always, to Wes White and Julie Bronder for their roles in producing the show each and every week. Really appreciate that. Once again, shout out to everyone who tuned in. We'll keep it rolling throughout the summer. And we'll talk to you next time here on the Take 10 Podcast.